So today we're going to talk about a holy habit. And I don't have two this week. I only have one. And we're going to dive into it. And it's kind of an interesting one because we don't talk about this one often. We talk about prayer. We talked about that last week. We talked about meditation, which was a little odd, but I think once people got the understanding of what biblical meditation was, people were a little more open to it. Well, today I'm going to talk about something that most Americans are not great at, much less most church people. And today we're going to talk about fasting. That's what I thought. <laughs> Wasn't going to be a lot of woo -hoo, woo -hoo, fasting. Yeah, I can't wait to not eat. Most of us, how many of you, how many of you enjoy eating? Amen. How many of you would consider yourself to have a spiritual gift of eating? <laughs> there are times I thought I was called to it. Like the Lord said, <laughs> here you go. Um, but I think it's really misunderstood. I think it's misunderstood. I think it's, I think it's misused. And, and I think you got to clarify what it is. Some people are like, man, I, I, I tried to fast, but your reason for trying to fast might not have been biblically correct. Like there's some people that use fasting for health reasons. They intermittent fast and I've got my window from four o'clock to seven o'clock and I can't eat anything in that window. And, or that's the window I can eat in and I don't eat in the other window, which sounds insane, but cause I like food. But that's, that's, that's a fast for physical purposes. And then how many of you ever had a toddler that just refuses to eat? That's a power play. That's what that is. They, they, they're just doing that for power in the relationship. To go, I'm not eating. Yes, you are. And then you both sit at the dining room table while the mac and cheese gets super hard and crusty, right? <laughs> Anybody been there, parents? You've been there? So, so that, that's not what I'm talking about today. I, I'm not talking about fasting for a power play. I'm not talking about fasting for, for physical benefit. I want to talk today about biblical fasting for the biblical purpose of spiritual development and growth. Jesus said this. He said, I will draw nigh unto you. And God said, I'll draw nigh to you. If, if you'll draw nigh to me, I'll draw nigh to you. I said this last week. It's, it's a catalyst move that if we, if we intentionally draw close to God, it, it causes a reaction in heaven for him to draw close to us. This, when, when he sees us move towards him, the heart of God says, they're coming and I want to meet them. You see this not only in that verse, but you see it in the story of the prodigal son. We know the son said, I'm going to go home. But we also know that the father saw him from a far way off and ran to him. The son started to come home. The father met him. If you'll draw nigh to me, I'll draw close to you. And so that's what I want us to do. That's what these disciplines are all about. It's not about me giving you another punch list of things you have to do for God. It's not a list of commandments and laws. It's a list of things, of disciplines that you can do to draw closer to a God who the only thing he's wanted since the fall in the garden is to, to be with you. Right. He just wants to be with you. And so as we talk through fasting today, some of you are like, man, I didn't come to hear a preaching on fasting. Well, that's okay. You're going to get it anyway. That I don't have anything else, to, I don't have anything else to, to do, so we're going to preach that one today. And I hope you learned something from it, because I think, I think it is interesting, because I do think there's a lot of confusion on it. And so first thing I want to kind of dive into, the first question I want to ask is something that I think is one that may be kind of interesting, is that is, is fasting required of Christians? And, and some people are like, I mean, it's in the Bible. There's a lot of stuff in the Bible but is this required of us as, as Christians under the new covenant? Is this, and that's the question we get. Is this, a, is this a New Testament thing or is this an Old Testament thing? Because we see a lot of fasting in the Old Testament. Originally in the Old Testament, there was only one day set aside for fasting by the law. And that was the Day of Atonement. And on the Day of Atonement, they would fast on that Day of Atonement. But all other fasting typically came when God spoke to the nation and said, we need, you need God's direction. And so I'm going to call on a fast. I'm going to call a nationwide fast or the prophet would go fast for direction. And we see those things in and around, but we don't necessarily see God going, you must fast, or it's not listed in the 10 that most people are familiar with. But then Israel did what Israel does. And they got this law or this, this standard of fasting on the day of atonement. 
And then if you study the Old Testament, you see Israel kind of have this method of madness. It was, we're God's chosen people and it's amazing. We want to be anyone else's chosen people and so now we're in captivity. And then God delivers them and then they go back. And God delivers them and they go back. And God delivers them and they go back. That's, that's kind of how the New Testament look or the Old Testament looks with the children of Israel. And so by the end of the Old Testament, in the book of Zechariah, we get a little better clarity on what the Jewish people did in regards to fasting. So it wasn't just the day of atonement. In Zechariah chapter eight, it says this. Thus says the Lord of the hosts, the fast of the fourth month and the fast of the fifth month and the fast of the seventh month and the fast of the 10th month shall be to the house of Judah seasons of joy and gladness and cheerful feast. So the idea of what fasting was really for, because people would fast when they were mourning, there's this transition that's happened. So no, 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 these fasts, these, these established fasts in the fourth month, the fifth month, the seventh month, and the 10th month are going to be feast of joy. You said, you said it's a fast. Is it a feast or is it a fast? It's a fast, but at the end of the fast, you feast. Okay? And so you say, well, Pastor Vance, is this, is this something now? So as a Christian, I'm supposed to fast in April and May and July in October. Well, let me ask you just a simple question. Are you Jewish? Because this, these fasts connected more with the Jewish calendar rather than just this move of, of being led to fast. Now, I, I listen, I'm going to tell you that fast in the 10th month, not a bad idea. That's October. It can create some space for eating season, which starts in November and December. No, you got Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Super Bowl food all in that four-month window. Don't do that. That's not biblical. All right. I just want to clarify. If somebody's like, "That's a great note, Pastor Ben," that's not what I'm, that's not what I'm talking about. So, the idea, say, was it required? Well, what we see in the Old Testament, these requirements, these were for people. These were Israelites. These were the Jewish people. These were things that they would have done regardless. It would have just been part of what they do. You say, okay, so if it's not required, Vince, then what's the question? My thought is, is it, a, is it an expectation for me as what we call a New Testament believer? I, don't misunderstand. I am a believer under the covenant of Jesus Christ who died on a cross and his blood was shed for me. And I have accepted that for my salvation. It doesn't discount the Old Testament. Please do not hear me saying that because you will never hear me say that. That book, that portion of scripture is critical for us, for teaching, for learning, all of those things. But what about me? What about in the New Testament? What about this. And so as I started digging into the New Testament and started kind of trying to figure out, okay, is this an expectation that I have? Is this, is this something I need? Is this something God's looking for me to do? Or do I just kind of lean into the big three? I'm going to pray. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to go to church. Pray, read my Bible, go to church. Pray, read my Bible, go to church. If you can sing, then you can add the fourth one and you can sing on that. But if you can't sing, it's best not just don't. I'm just kidding. Okay. But that's kind of what we do, right? We, we kind of lay it into those big three. Pray, read your Bible, go to church. Pray, read your Bible, go to church. What you, I'm, trying to go to, I'm trying to get to church more often. I'm trying to read my Bible more often. I'm trying to pray a little better. We do that and we miss some of the things, just like we talked about with meditation last week. We miss some of the things that God may be trying to instruct us in. Some of the things God may be trying to move into our life and go, hey, I have something a little more for you but it's going to take a little more from you. Are you in? Now, I'm going to show you some scripture where I think we as the modern church, not just in America, but I think the modern church more, I think we've, I, I don't think fasting has been eliminated. I think we've just forgotten it. I just think we don't do it because it's a little weird and it's very uncomfortable and we don't like uncomfortable. Like we pray, but not in front of people. 
right? I'll read my Bible, but I'm not going to ask questions. Why? Because it's uncomfortable to ask questions. It's uncomfortable to pray in front of people. It's uncomfortable to do those things. And if those things are uncomfortable, then fasting, setting aside food, come on, Pastor Vince. Like I'm I, like some of you have plans for food right after church and I'm preaching on fasting. I don't expect you to fast right after church. All right. It's okay. Go eat that roast or whatever it is. It's fine. But I think we've forgotten it. I think we've set it so far aside that we don't actually look into what God is asking us to do. And you see it in the New Testament. So I want to dive into this, all right? So is it an expectation? If you have your Bible, you can turn with me to Acts chapter 13, okay? Acts chapter 13, grab your Bible, turn there. Because I'm going to be in 13 and 14. And once you get to Acts chapter 13 and 14, I want you to flip back over to Matthew chapter 6. Is where we're going to be. So Matthew, Acts chapter 13 and, and, and 14, I'll give you the scripture in just a second. But then in Matthew chapter six, thank you. I love hearing the Bible pages turn. It is going to be on the screen so you can follow along there if you need to. Um, but if you don't, again, in, again, if you don't have a Bible, let us know. We want to make sure you're equipped to have one. So here's what it says. Acts chapter 13 verses two and three. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting... The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work of which I have called them. Now, I just want to break this down a little bit, all right? I'm not going to dive into this real deep, but I want you to see something. How many of you in the room would go, um, this right here, well, let me see if I can get it to work now. Maybe. We'll see. It's not. Worshiping. How many of you would question whether worshiping is questionable to do to God? No. How many of you would say that's a no-brainer? We worship God. So like that's a no-brainer. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting and fasting. So something that we would call a no-brainer is listed with something that we might not really be comfortable with. So what I'm wanting you to see is a biblical theme that gets established in these two verses. So as we get into these two verses, we see while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, then what happens? The Holy Spirit responds to them with very clear direction. Set me apart, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. Now, if I were just to ask you and go, hey, how many of you would really like clear direction from the Holy Spirit? Everybody says yes. No Christian's like, you know what? I'm kind of good with the fuzzy stuff. If you can just give me like a... Kind of. That would be great. No, we want, we want him to tell us what to do. I want to know, God, I want to know what to do, not kind of what to do. I want to know what to do. When he, they prayed and fasted, we see here that the Spirit responds clearly. It's a clear answer. There's no confusion in the answer. And so once we see this clear answer, we go, okay, what caused the clear answer while we were worshiping and fasting? while we were worshiping and fasting. So as we keep moving, then after fasting and what? Praying. Now, how many of you would question that praying is a pretty common we should be doing that? Of course, prayer, yeah, prayer is a big one. That's one of the big three. Pray, read your Bible, go to church. Pray, read your Bible, go to church. So if it's a big three, but you notice it's listed and fasting and and praying, worshiping and fasting, fasting and praying, these things that we would call common acts of Christianity, fasting is listed with them. It's just listed with it. Like, why aren't you doing this? Like, of course they're praying and fasting. Some people would say, why would you do one without the other? Yeah, it's just a part of what we do. But it's weird. We've, we've made it weirder. It's become this weird thing that, that people don't get. And because they don't get it, and this is just a fault of us as humans, when we don't understand something, we make light of it or discard it. And so people don't get it, and because they don't get it, they discard it. And because they discard it, they don't reap the benefits from it. 
They don't see the blessing that happens with fasting and prayer. And praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So in these two passages, what you see here in chapter 13 and verse 2 and 3 is you see the council praying for direction. We were worshiping and we were fasting and the Spirit gave us direction. And then we were fasting and we were praying so that the Spirit would give them power as they sent them off. If I were to say to you again, simply, hey, how many of you would love direction and power from the Holy Spirit in your daily life? Nobody turns that down. Nobody's like, you know what? I don't think I want power to accomplish the thing God wants me to do. I think I'm going to just kind of wing it. No, you want power. I want to be able to accomplish what God has for me. But I need to be able to dive into what it is he's asking me to do. And it may mean, I, and again, if I want a greater thing, I may, need to give a, I may need to sacrifice and go, Lord, how do you want me to draw closer to you? How do I draw closer to you, God? And so the question of is it an expectation, we, we can keep going because this theme continues in Acts in verse 14. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, again, it's just part of the language. It's not an odd thing. It's not, it says and fasting, but please don't hear this as an additional, it's, ju it's just what they did. It, it, all, it would have probably been uncommon to see it just say with prayer they committed them to the Lord. It was probably more common to go when we, well, we prayed and we fasted. Why? Because we needed direction and, and they needed power. We needed direction, they needed power. So we're praying for power and direction from God and we pray and fast to get that. Now, this is jumping ahead because I think what we see sometimes we go, okay, yeah, but that's the disciples. What does Jesus say about it? Matthew chapter six, turn your Bible back. Matthew chapter six, we see this pop up because people go, okay, so it's not necessarily a requirement, but does God expect me to do it? Well, here's Jesus speaking in Matthew chapter six. And Jesus speaks very clearly and he says, and when you fast. That's pretty clear, right? Everybody's, everybody's tracking with that. When you fast. Not, not if you fast or if you're considering it. When you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. I love Jesus. If you're wondering a modern day translation... Snickers commercials have done a great job with this. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You ain't you when you're hungry? Yeah. And when, how many of you ain't, you ain't you when you're hungry? I want you to understand something. That's the point of the fast. Because you may be getting in the way and God needs you to be something different. And so you ain't you when you're hungry. He says, when you fast, don't, don't, don't look like the, don't look like the hypocrites. They, they twist their face up and they, they, and they do it just so you can see that they're fasting. And, and listen, the, the Pharisees at this time, they were pros at this. Like they would literally step out into the center of the street. My God, I thank you that I am not it's these people right here. That's, I mean, they would literally point these people. And the Lord, you've blessed me because I tithe and I, I fast two days a week. I'm starving, but I do it suffering for the Lord. That, that's, that's not in your Bible. That was added. <laughs> that's what they would have done. It would have been a show. It would have been so that, so that you could see how much I'm suffering for God so that you could see how much I'm, I'm, I'm battling for the Lord and how much I'm, I'm just under this, this constant pressure to always be sharing this, this grievous fasting that I'm doing and I hope you see it because it's bad. And God says, well, let me tell you, they have received their reward. If they wanted people to see it and that was their goal, you got it. That's what they got. People saw them fasting. 
Well, what if they were praying for direction? Well, I don't think that was their intention. They just wanted people to see them fasting. And so they got what they asked for was that, that was a reward. But you, but you, but when you fast, he says it again, second time, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. Now, when you see someone anointed in scripture by someone else, that has some spiritual weight. When this passage happens, <laughs> this passage is take a bath and clean yourself up. Like it shouldn't be obvious that you're suffering. It shouldn't be obvious that this is a struggle. Anoint yourself so you're not smelling funky. Wash your face. Go about your day is what Jesus is in essence saying. Go about your day. That your fasting may not be seen by others, but your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret, he'll reward you. He'll reward you. Now, I want to clarify something on this because I've heard people talk about, well, fasting is like giving. You don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. And you don't, you don't do this. And, and, and I don't, I'm fasting, but I'm not telling anybody. Well, here's the thing. When, you're like, when you act like that, you make it weird. I'm just telling you, you make it weird. Because people are like, hey, you can go grab some lunch. No, 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 I'm good. Well, what? Why not? We're all going to lunch. I'm good. I'm good. We're going to go to lunch. What are you going to do? I'm, I'm fasting. <laughs> fasting. The issue isn't sharing it. The issue isn't, hey, I'm fasting right now. Okay, cool. The issue is that we've made it so awkward where the Jewish people, it was so normal that it wasn't about don't do it so other people don't see it. It was don't do it so everybody's looking at you do it. We should be, I, I know I'm fasting right now. Cool, all right, see you this afternoon. Great. And moving on. I should be able to go, Joe, buddy, I'm going into a fast. I want you praying for me. And that not be out of arrogance of, hey, Joe, going into a fast and I just wanted you to know. No, that's not what I'm doing. That's not the intention. When Jesus says, let it be in secret, it's not, you got to hide this from the world. It's, this is something inwardly I'm doing in you, but it's not, it should be so normal for us. It shouldn't be an awkward thing when we talk about fasting. We're Christians. They've done it since the very beginning. Throughout the New Testament, we see it for power and for direction and for guidance. We see it. And so please, can we not make it weird? Because that's what we've done. That's why we don't do it. We don't understand it. And since we don't understand it, we discount it or we lessen it. When in reality, we should be coming alongside of one another and going, hey, I'm going into a season of fasting, just praying for some direction and some power from God. Can you be praying for me? Absolutely, I got you. And that's the end of the discussion. That's it. When, when we as Christians begin to act like something is weird, that's when the world goes, you're weird. You're weird. And, then, and I don't even know why, but that's weird. And so we have to be careful with this. We have, I want you to see that there is a reason. He says, wash your face. Kick. It should just, it's Tuesday. Go act like it's Tuesday. And go through your day like it's Tuesday. And pray because I know the reason you're here. And you know the reason you're here. And let that be enough. It's amazing to me, I'll tell you, when, when Aaron and I set this schedule up last fall, I think it was October, we get been praying about spiritual disciplines. And here's the thing, man, I could, I could run you through this. I could check the list, meditation, prayer, fasting, Bible study, silence and solitude, serving, all the, I could run you through the list and I could teach you information about the disciplines of God. I could do that. Be great. But last year, we didn't know this year was coming. And I guarantee, I, I, every person on our staff over the last nine months has walked through storm and trial and attack. Every person on our staff. And so when I say this is something that 
as you draw near to God, he draws near to you. Please understand it's not just coming from a checklist of teaching. It's coming through a season of having nothing but Christ to lean into. And go, God, I don't know how to answer this. I don't know how to fight through this. I don't even know what to fight. So I'm just coming to you and I need your presence. And Lord, if you want me to fast, I'll fast, but I'm going to dive into your word and I'm going to, I'm going to embrace more of you and I'm going to, I'm going to rest. I'm going to figure out a way to rest, even though it's the thing I am worst at on this list of disciplines. But because God, not because I want to be able to preach it, but because God, I need you. I need to experience it. So this fasting isn't for me just to give you another check mark on your Christian duties thing you can do. No, no, it's not like that. In fact, I will tell you, if you don't have prayer on lock, don't go into a fast. You won't know what to do when you get there. You're just going to be hungry. I'm not lying. If you don't know how to pray, and you haven't spent time in the Lord before you go, God, I feel like you're leading me to an, into a fast. I, I feel like you're calling me into this. You got to have some stuff to do while you're there. Or the enemy's going to attack you. He's going to attack you anyway, but he's going to attack you in ways that are going to get you. So you got to be equipped before you get there. This is, this is a process. This isn't, hey, I think tomorrow I'm going to do a 40-day fast with nothing but water. You'll die. Okay. Maybe not physically, but your spouse will kill you because by day four, you're going to be grumpy, okay? <laughs> so, like, I, I want you to know as we give these disciplines that, that, that they're for you so that you grow in the process. So, how many of you have the cards in your lap and you're kind of freaked out because I haven't filled in any of your blanks yet? All right, I've, I've got you. I've got you. All right. We're getting there right now. That was see my teacher row back there like, um, come on. Uh, so as we get into this, this, this next step, I'm going to give you the three types of fast found in the Bible. And then I'm going to tell you what is not a fast. And some of you are going to be mad at me. All right. So here we go. Three types of fast found in the Bible. First one is this, a standard fast. No food, only water or liquid. Let me clarify, liquid. Some of you are like... Dr. Pepper. Here, yeah, amen. Here's what I need you to know. Just because you process a cheeseburger down to a liquid doesn't mean you're fasting. Listen, we are humans and we will do our best to find the loophole, baby. No. The standard fast for what we see Jesus do in the wilderness. He did his for 40 days. That's a lot. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. What we don't hear Jesus say is, I thirst. He said that later. But he didn't say it in the wilderness because on a standard fast, he would have been able to have water. All right? This is the most common. No food, only water. The amount of days... It's typically between you and the Lord as you work that out, as you build up, as you just grow deeper in your walk with God and you grow deeper in understanding how long. Some people start with a day. Some people start with two days. Uh, you see a lot of three-day fast in the Bible. That's a, there's, a, there's, there's several three-day fasts. We'll hit them in just a second. So it's, that's up to you, but it is no food, not even blended food, and water. Okay. Now, what I will tell you with fasting, uh, there's a great on the cards. If you don't have a card, you can grab one on your way out. I believe there's still some on the tables back there. But on the card down at the bottom, there's a QR code. And on that QR code, there is a really fantastic devotional this week on fasting. Some really great stuff on that QR code. So I challenge you to do it. It's in the YouVersion app. And I believe one of the things it talks to is about how you go into a fast and how you come out of the fast. Because like you don't want to go on a several day fast and then be like, I'm going to Colton's, baby. And then stuff up on all those rolls because you are going to be miserable for several days if you do that. There's a way to do it. There's a process. That's the standard fast. 
The partial fast. We see this happen, choice foods or meats. You see Daniel do this. Chadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel. People of Babylon said, this is what you're going to eat. Daniel said, hold the phone. Can we try something? He's like, what do you want to try? He said, well, why don't you let us eat what we want to eat and you all eat what you want to eat and we'll see what God does at the end of it. And so Daniel does this partial fast. They do fruits and vegetables. That's all. No delicacies, no meats, no anything like that. And they did fruits, vegetables, and water. And they got through that. And as they get to the end of it, the Bible tells us the story is in the book of Daniel. You can find it. it says that their countenance was better. Their, their strength was better. All of these things. And you say, well, it's because they went vegan. No, it's because because they follow what God wanted them to do. As a meat lover, I claim that. <laughs> they followed God's, followed his direction. And in following his direction, he gave them power. You see this. And so that's the fast there. Then you get to the total fast. No food, no drink. Now medically, you can survive for a while without food. How many of you have some stored up? this guy. Water, you got to be very careful. Okay. Total fast in the Bible, or the ones you see most recurring are three days. When Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus and got up from his salvation experience with Jesus, he was blind. And for three days, he had no food or no drink for three days. It's also about the time the journey took for him to get where he needed to, where the scales fell off his eyes and he began to eat again. And he took food. Esther in the Old Testament, the children of Israel are about to be eradicated, extinguished. They were going to just kill all of them. And Esther said, go to the people and call for a fast. They shall eat nothing, neither shall they drink for three days and will pray for God's deliverance. And God delivered you see some extreme cases. You see Moses' fast. You see even Elijah's fast where the buzzards ended up feeding him later on. I'm afraid if a buzzard dropped my food off and was like, oh, and that's, I'd still be fasting. <laughs> I'd be like, Lord, good idea. Not your guy, okay? <laughs> I'm just being honest, all right? And so, so you see some extreme, what I would call supernatural moments where these, some of these no food, no water get extended to crazy amounts of time. But you also see a supernatural hand of God type of thing happening in the midst of it. All right? So A, if you've never fasted before, tomorrow is not the day to start a 40-day no food, no water fast. All right? Don't do that. Don't do that. Pray, ask for direction, ask for direction and listen. He'll tell you, hey, start with a couple days, start with tomorrow. But let me clarify, people go, how about, I, it, can, I just, can I just fast a meal? Yes, but it can't be one you already don't eat. I don't ever eat breakfast, so I'll just fast breakfast. That's not fasting, that's cheating. It has to be a sacrifice. Let me clarify something else. Fasting from social media is not a fast. Fasting from other things in the world, not fast. Those aren't fast. Those are focus, but they're not fasting. Here's why. Let me clarify this for you. Because the reality is sometimes we want to do that. The biblical reason for fasting is sacrifice some, fa sacrificing something sustaining. It has to sustain you. It has to sustain you to depend on God rather than giving up something entertaining in order to focus on him. It's a distraction. And you may want to stop distractions in your life. You may want to give up some distractions. You may want to take less time on social media, Facebook. You may want to take less time watching TV. You may take, want to take less time doing those things. But that is not fasting. Let me explain what that is. That's discipline. That I'm not going to spend the hour scrolling. I'm going to go pray or I'm going to go spend some time in the Word. That's discipline. That's not fasting because if you need social media to sustain you, you have bigger issues that we need to walk through. You, you may have an addiction problem. Well, it's just Facebook. Still addiction. 
It's just a video game. Still addiction. If you can't be disciplined with it, does it have mastery over you? Does it stop you from doing the things that you ought to be doing throughout your day? It's a discipline issue. Fasting is, Lord, I'm going to sacrifice this thing that I need in order to come to you for the need so that you can provide the need because I've kind of got in a rut of believing that I'm the provider and that I'm the sustainer and in reality it has always been you and I need to refocus. I need to refocus. So God, I'm hungry right now, but I need you to fill my heart and my soul instead of me feeding my face. I need you to fill my heart to where I'm leaning into you and I'm, and I'm drawing close to you rather than me just making sure that I'm satisfied here and now. It has to be something sustaining. And you have to sacrifice that which is sustaining so that it shows dependence on the one who can truly sustain you. Say, so Pastor Vince, I don't, that's a lot. No, it is a lot. It's not easy. That's why I said it's uncomfortable. And things that are uncomfortable, we, we, don't, we don't like to do things that are uncomfortable. But it's real and it's biblical and you can see where the New Testament church did it. And I can tell you and I can probably point you to others to tell you this is what it's done in their life. This is the direction they found. This is the power they found. This is, these are the answers that they found by following this out, by just taking the step of fasting. All these disciplines, that scripture where Jesus says, and when you fast, don't, don't complain about it, just do it. Do it unto me and, I'll, and I'll, I'll reward you. You can take the word fasting out and you can probably replace it with any of the disciplines we're gonna talk about and you're gonna see God's promise be the same. When you pray, when you fast, when you study your Bible, when you meditate, when you focus on me, when you rest in me, when you do any of these things that we're going to go over the next several weeks, when you do any of these things and you draw close to me, I will be there. I will be there. And I don't know what storm's coming in your life. I don't know what kind of chaos sits right around the corner. I know the devil is a is a destroyer and he is seeking you. I seen a thing this week where somebody posted about, well, if, uh, if, you're not, if you're not doing anything, the devil's not gonna attack you. That's baloney. The devil would rather kill you while you're down. He wants less work, so he'll just cut your throat while you're laying there. He, 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 wants, he wants to kill you, not leave you alone. Because if he leaves you alone, there's a chance you'll come back. I want to destroy you whether you're doing good or you're not. That's what he's after. I don't know what storm's coming for you. you. Say, Vince, this is awful. This is not very encouraging at all. It is because I'm giving you the tools to stand in the storm. Amen. To stand in it. I got this. God, you got me. God, you got me. I'm going to draw close to you. No, it's not comfortable, but I'm going to draw close to you. As we move into the close of this service, we have communion available on either side of the church this morning. Say we, you preached on fasting and we got bread and water, bread and wine, yeah. Yeah, because both really represent sacrifice. You see, had it not been for Jesus counting the cost and explaining the cost to the disciples by saying, take this body, this bread, that represents my body that's broken for you. Take this cup that represents my blood which has been poured out for you as an offering. See, I understand the cost, fellas. It's gonna take everything. It's gonna take everything from me to give you an opportunity to not just be with me, but to have me within you. It's gonna take everything. But I've counted the cost and I'm gonna walk through it. 
This morning, as you take communion, I want you to do the same thing and say, Lord, I'm going to count the cost. What do you need from me that will draw me closer to you? What do you need from me? I I understand your salvation was paid for. Please don't hear me saying that. I understand you're saved. I understand you know Jesus. I understand that salvation was a free gift. That's not what I'm talking about. Christians in the house, what what does God need from you so that you draw closer to him? What distraction does he need to remove? What sustaining thing in your life does he need to replace? I want you to bow with me, church. As we prepare to take communion this morning, and as you begin to prepare your heart, the Bible says that we examine ourselves, and this is that time where you get to do that, where just you and God, you may be hear me talking in the background, but for just a few minutes, I just want you getting very real with the Savior, with the one who pulled you out, the one who gave you something solid to stand on, the one who redeemed you. I want you to get real serious with him for a few moments. Lord, forgive me of my sins. God, I pray you'd lay me bare, open me up so that I know what to repent of. And Lord, as I repent, give me clarity on what you need from me. God, what do you want from me? God, what do I need to sacrifice? What do I need to set aside? so that I can focus on you, so that I can draw close to you. God, what what is that thing? In a moment, I'm just gonna pray, and as I pray, we've, we've already given you the announcements, we've already taken up the offering. When I say amen, you are welcome to come and take communion. You're welcome to be dismissed this morning, but But what is it, God, that I need to lay aside? What are you calling me to sacrifice? What are you asking me to step into? Father, I come to you this morning and I thank you. God, I pray that as we prepare our hearts now, God, as people are seeking your face and, Lord, seeking your forgiveness and, Lord, they're repenting to you. I pray that you'd set our hearts right and our minds right as we prepare to take communion this morning, that we would, that we would come with the right heart, with the right attitude, with the right worship. And that, Lord, as we come before you, we would come boldly, but, Lord, we would come repentant. And that we would take this bread that represents this body that was broken for us the agony of the cross. And we'd remember. God, we would remember what you gave us. God, that we would take the cup. This cup of the New Testament, this blood that was poured out on our behalf. And we'd remember that although there was a cross, there is an empty tomb. And you have given us hope. So God, bless this table today as we come. Bless these people as they come. And bless our walk this week as we seek you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.